welcome, welcome to tonight's program in the Out and Out series, which has been going on here, it's sponsored by the Ideas and Issues Committee of the Lincoln County Community Directorate over the past two weeks. And we'll be concluding tomorrow night and Sunday night with a couple of additional events that may be of interest to you tomorrow night at 7.30 in this hall. Professor Carla Jay of Pace University will be speaking, giving a slideshow on a lesbian literary tour of Paris. And on Sunday night in the Lakeshore cafeteria of the Union, there will be a cabaret with four local groups uh, performing and presenting the Madison Gaines Chorale, Woman Song, Margot Luark and Friends, and Madison Gay Theater Project Incorporated. I'd also like to announce that after tonight's presentation, there will be a reception with a cash bar in the lobby here in Birch Hall. You're all cordially invited to participate in that. And finally, I would like to announce who the uh, funders of tonight's program are. Uh, the principal sponsor of tonight's presentation is Symposium, which is a, an association of UW gay faculty members, an informal a discussion group here on campus. And we also have received support from the uh, university's humanistic fund, from the UW history department, from the UW program in medieval studies, the Wisconsin Student Association, uh, Madison's New Harvest Foundation, and Milwaukee's Supreme City Business Association, from the 10% Society, a student group here on campus, from Madison Integrity Dignity, which is a group of uh, gay Christians uh, in, in the Episcopalians and Catholics. And finally, uh, from the Wisconsin Humanities Committee with funds provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Now I'd like to introduce uh, one of the principal uh, spokesmen of Symposium, our back of the group, that's Professor John Kirsch, who will introduce tonight's speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. This is, from my point of view, the highlight of this, this whole academic year, something we've worked for uh, since last July. And I'm, of course, honored and delighted to introduce tonight's speaker. But there's a sense in which I'm not sure I'm the person to do it. Because there's a real danger that when a person writes a book as significant and as well received as John Boswell's Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality, that his or her work will seem to consist mostly of that particular study. And that's not the case for John, whose work spans an enormous range of topics in the general area of medieval history and culture. Nonetheless, there is a unifying theme, which is important to all of us here tonight, and that is the attitude toward and the treatment of minorities in Western society. This was already evident in John's uh, uh, doctoral work at Harvard, which was published as The Royal Treasures, the, or The Royal Treasure, the first and I think very likely unsurpassable study of the condition of the Muslim community in Spain after the reconquest of that country by the Christians. And it continues, of course, through his magisterial study of the church and gay people. His current work continues the theme of minorities. He's working on a new study of the treatment of abandoned children in the Middle Ages, and he's also working on an overall consideration of the three religions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, in uh, Western society during this period that he's interested in. And his talk tonight on the Jews, gays, and the bicycle riders will <laughs> provide yet another illustration of his concern with commonalities in the perception of minorities by Western cultures and its translation into action by such, such groups or toward such groups. It would, of course, be a mistake to imagine that a book as challenging as uh, Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality would be received positively by everybody. There's a novel, and I've forgotten all the particulars, but except the beginning, which opens with a comment by the narrator, and I quote, that my mother always warned me against getting involved with Yale men. <laughs> Perverts of the intellect, she called them. John Boswell is no such pervert. Yale man of <laughs> But the, uh, the central thesis of his book, that the attitude of the church toward gay people was not, until relatively recently, uniformly or aggressively negative, was bound to upset both apologists for and antagonists of established religion, at the same time, of course, that it delighted and persuaded many of us. 
its superb style and its scholarship were uh, quickly garnered for John a number of literary and scholarly prizes, including the American Book Award in History for 1981. However uncomfortable his conclusions might have been for a great number of people, it's extremely difficult to argue with a person like John who, about the meaning, for example, of a biblical passage, who is able to integrate in his work perceptions about not only human but also natural history, psychology, physiology, philosophy, and the unassailable insights that are generated by his mastery of 17 languages and the literatures thereof. Since 1981, John, of course, has extended his studies outlined in, in this book, uh, both in his scholarly works and in his numerous activities on behalf of gay people in many communities, but hardly to the exclusion of his other interests. His, his ardent and effective teaching was quickly recognized by Yale students who voted him one of Yale's 10 best teachers soon after his arrival there, and he served his department and his university in many important capacities since. But that gay studies is one important theme of his work and a significant ingredient of his academic success should be and is, I think, an inspiration to all gay people. The latest uh, Advocate magazine has got a retrospective compilation of Donilon cartoons in it, and my favorite shows a real cute guy sitting on a park bench holding hands with Superman uh, to whom he says, but just think, just think what it would do for our image if you came out. <laughs> Indeed, to have someone like Boswell, to have someone like Boswell in our intellectual corner is scarcely less significant to the advancement of the lesbian and gay culture that we celebrate this week. But lest the Superman analogy seem merely an intellectual conceit, drawing a false correspondence between the accomplishments of the mind and those of the body. Uh, I should like to mention in conclusion John's latest award, which was also presented to him by the Yale students. Recently, the Yale Daily News, which is a sort of poor imitation of the Daily Cardinal, uh, <laughs> conducted a very careful Kinsey-esque survey of Yale students' sex lives. One question asked the undergraduates by the magazine was, to choose and to rate the professors with the greatest sex appeal. <laughs> when John entered his departmental office on Valentine's Day, he was, for very, very good reason, greeted with applause from the uh, secretaries and from his departmental chairman. And so we, Symposium, Out and About, and all the groups that have contributed to this, present for your edification and enjoyment, John Boswell, Yale's number one sexiest professor. <laughs> Jews, Gay People, and Bicycle Riders contains in it a reference which, in fact, John Kirsch, to trade compliments, is the only person whom I have ever mentioned is clever enough immediately to catch the reference. In Catherine Ann Porter's novel, Ship of Fools, there is a character fleeing Nazi Germany who is forced to share a cabin on a ship with a man of Nazi sympathies who is constantly railing against the Jews as the origin of all the world's problems. It is because of them that Europe has fallen on hard times, because of them that the social situation in Germany is collapsing, because of them that any evil that one might mention has arisen in the world. And the sensitive person forced to listen to all this gets more and more disgusted. And finally, on one occasion, when the Nazi sympathizer has said, it is the Jews, can't you see that it's the Jews? Um, the sensitive person says, yes, you're right, it is the Jews. It's the Jews and the bicycle riders. And so the Nazi sympathizer says, the bicycle riders? Why the bicycle riders? And the other fellow says, why the Jews? What I want to talk about tonight is why the Jews, why gay people, why any group, why societies decide that some things will be acceptable and other things won't be acceptable. I want to begin by reading you a text, a very special sort of taxonomy. It is written in a Chinese encyclopedia of the Middle Ages that animals are divided into 14 categories. One, belonging to the emperor. Two, embalmed. <laughs> Three, tame. Four, suckling pigs. 
Five, sirens. Six, fabulous. Seven, stray dogs. Eight, included in the present classification. Nine, frenzied. Ten, innumerable. Eleven, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush. <laughs> Twelve, etc. <laughs> Thirteen, having just broken the water pitcher. Fourteen, and my personal favorite, appearing to be flies from a long way off. <laughs> the relevance of the Chinese encyclopedia will become apparent, I think, towards the end of my talk. What I want to talk about very specifically is how different elements and cultures in Western society have set standards for what is acceptable, acceptable both in a public arena and acceptable privately. That is, what standards have been for personal and social good, how these standards are determined, and most particularly, their relation to the well-being of societies and to the members of the societies, and those are two different things. I'm going to focus particularly on two minorities, who, which have been central focuses of my work, Jews and gay people. I'm going to use three broad divisions in discussing this issue of public and private standards. The first I'm going to call the ancient world, by which I mean Greco-Roman city-states, that is, the city-states around the Mediterranean, from about 400 before the present era to about 400 of the present era, that is, about 400 BC or about 400 AD. The second division I'm going to refer to is Catholic Europe, by which I mean Western Europe from about 400 AD to about 1600. And the third division to which I will refer is the Industrial West, by which I mean Europe and the United States from about the 18th century to the present. In the ancient world, there were two standards, one personal and one public, which were widely recognized. You understand I don't speak with statistical certainty that every human being is subscribing to these, but there were two widely recognized standards. The personal standard might be subsumed under the Greek word arete, which cannot be exactly translated, but means more or less excellence. The public standard of what was acceptable or good was, by and large, good citizenship. Arete is an individual standard, although some aretai, which would be the plural, are admired more than others, and it was mostly determined by philosophers. Good citizenship was not individual in the same sense. It was a public question. It mostly related to what was good for the state, the state being a city or a city-state in this context. What constituted good citizenship was determined by and large by legislation, although it was informed by education and philosophy. The power of legislation was determined by legislative bodies, like the Roman Senate, through a combination of wisdom and strength in numbers in the minds of most people. This was expressed, for instance, at Rome in the slogan, the Maior et Sanior Pars, what the Maior et Sanior Pars decided to do was what constituted good citizenship or being a good resident of the Roman Republic. Maior et Sanior Pars is a very interesting pun because it can mean the older and wiser part or it can mean the greater and wiser part. This is a very canny and realistic ambivalence on the part of the Romans that the greater part can on the one hand because it has greater number enforce its decision over the minority more easily than the minority could enforce its decision over the majority. But there is also implicit in the expression Maior et Sanior Pars, the idea that the Maior Pars, both because it includes more people and because they are older, involves more combined or accumulated wisdom. It was generally assumed in the ancient world that there was congruence between arete, that is excellence, and good citizenship, but arete could occur in anyone. RIT could occur in a non-citizen, it could occur in a female as well as in a male, it could occur in an enemy of the state, even in a barbarian, the lowest category in the minds of most of the residents of Greek or Roman city-states. Note that RIT is individualistic, it has no direct relation to any absolute truth, and note that the idea of good citizenship hasn't anything to do with inherited characteristics, it has to do with a conscious, deliberate choice. Once it is laid out, what it involves to be a good citizen, it is up to you to choose to be a good citizen or not. 
so that Virgil, for instance, praises in a very famous line Lucius Junius Brutus, who executes his own sons for treason, overlooking inheritance, overlooking what is natural in a sense. He executes his sons for treason, showing himself to be a good citizen, and is praised by Virgil with the immortal line, Vincet amor patriae, the love of one's native land, will triumph over everything else. In phase two of the development of standards of public and private good, Catholic Europe, uh, from about 400 AD, as I said, to about the middle of the 16th century, this very practical and realistic legislative ideal of the Romans is transformed into something really and not really novel and fascinating about the Christian religion, especially in the public sphere. The idea of the Meyer et Sanior Pars, a legislative body which by its accumulated wisdom in greater numbers determines what's good, is transformed into the idea of conciliar truth in the Christian church. It is no longer a question just of what's practical, how the state can most efficiently be run. It is now a means of revealing divine truth. For instance, when most of the Christian world is exercised over the question of whether the Son and the Father are of the same substance or only of similar substance, a question that you might find confusing in relation to an incorporeal being, but nonetheless, um, it was, was a vexing question. What the Christian church does under the guidance of, in fact, the Roman government is it calls a council, the Council of Nicaea, to decide if Jesus and God the Father are, in fact, the same in substance or only similar. And the way they decide this, not so surprisingly considering the council is called by a leader of the Roman state, is they take a vote. <laughs> now, 10 minutes before the vote, if you think that they're only similar in substance, you're in a minority. 10 minutes after the vote, if you think they're only similar in substance, you're dead wrong. Because, although it is not as clearly defined as you might have thought, considering what a remarkable achievement it is, the idea is that truth can be decided according to a vote in a council. According to the whole in a council can be expressed in Greek as katholon. Um, those of you who are classicists would expect it to be katholu, but in fact, in ecclesiastical Greek, it's katholon. Catholic means according to the whole. Things are decided, Catholic, according to the whole, by vote. I want to emphasize that although this is kind of funny in a way, that doesn't prove that it isn't true. Something could be funny and true. And um, I'm not prepared to say whether it's true or not. Uh, I, do, I am prepared to say that it's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> The idea is that once a decision has been taken by a council, Catholic, according to the whole, if you agree to subscribe to what the council has voted on Catholic, then you are Catholicos. You are Catholic. You are according to the whole. You are acknowledging the power of the council to decide what is true. So that the Catholic is the person who acknowledges the truth according to the whole in this interesting way. This gives rise to what becomes the major test of being a good person in a public context in Catholic Europe, and that is orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means having correct opinion according to truth as revealed Catholic in a council. Holding the right opinion, the Catholicos opinion, becomes a hallmark of being a good person in a public sphere in Catholic Europe. Councils continue to decide what the right opinion is by taking a vote. And I see having said that the Son is fully divine without giving any clarification, a group called the Nestorians then say that Jesus must have been both divine and human, and therefore he must have had two natures and two persons, a divine nature and a human nature, and a divine person and a human person. So a council, Ephesus in this case in 431, has to be called to take a Catholic on vote to decide this. It condemns this opinion and says that Jesus is in fact only one person. The Monophysites then say, since he's only one person, he must have had only one nature. And another council, Chalcedon in 451, has to be called and take a Catholic vote to say that, in fact, he is one person but two natures. Um, this, this seems funny, and as I say, it is funny in a way. The more sinister aspect is that those who do not subscribe to what is determined Catholic are often excluded from the state, from rights, in a few cases even from life, although by and large not until much later. This is because, not just because people were bigots back then, but because people thought sincerely that real absolute truth could be divulged in this way, Catholic, according to the whole. And to oppose the truth was to oppose God. Therefore, it was a dangerous thing. 
the personal corollary of Catholic on truth in a public sphere, um, what had been arete in the ancient world, becomes morals. Now, you may have thought that morals are just something that every society has, and in a certain sense that's true, but there's a subtlety about Western morals and the Catholic influence on the development of our notion of morality. Our word moral is derived from a Latin word in the singular most, but more commonly occurring in the plural, mores. And mores for Romans are not the same thing as our morals at all. Mores are somewhere in between etiquette and justice for the Romans. The closest I can think of in conveying this to an English-speaking audience is a British expression, it isn't done. <laughs> You mustn't do that because it isn't done. We don't name our children Herkimer because it isn't done. Um, but you might also say we don't molest children because it isn't done. That is to say, it isn't done could describe something trivial or something very important, something that really matters to human well-being. The point about it isn't done is that it's a deliberate British circumlocution to avoid having to say on what authority you mustn't do it. It isn't done expresses that it isn't our custom. It isn't the custom of the kind of people you would want to be counted among. And that's what the Roman idea of mores was. It was sometimes expressed in the slogan, most maiorum, the custom of this wiser and larger part. What happens, however, is that as the idea that the majority can determine theological truth by taking a vote gains a firmer and firmer foothold in the Catholic world, the idea becomes prominent that what the majority does, what its mores are, also represent some sort of divine truth. That is to say that what is Catholic in behavior, what is most common among Christians, becomes moral. And adherence to what is most common in behavioral terms comes to be thought of as virtue or good. What is done by the Christian community, Catholic, what is most common among the Christian community, is increasingly enacted in the same kind of councils that determine how many persons and natures are in Jesus. It is enacted in these councils as rules, generally called canons. Canons and the morals they enshrine are cumulative and irreversible. This is a salient characteristic of them. Once something is declared as the Catholic practice, of the Christian people, it cannot be expunged from the record. So that what is moral enacted in a council, let's say in Ankara in the third century of the Christian era, applies in France in the 10th century and in the United States in the 19th or 20th. Note that virtue, which is the term applied to adherence to morals in this sense, something which has now gone way beyond custom and etiquette and has a kind of absolute truth comparable to the decision of a council, Virtue is not necessarily excellence at all. Often it is simply conformity or a convention. St. Augustine says that in order to be virtuous, an act must not violate law, nature, or custom. Note that this is a very negative and conformist point of view. It doesn't say that it must adhere to some higher good. It must embody some greater good. It simply must not violate law, nature, or custom. That gives you a good idea of the way in which morals are enacted as being the Catholic practice of the Christian people. Now to move on to phase three, in the modern world, all of these notions of how to separate what's acceptable from what's unacceptable are replaced by a standard for persons for which I think the terms healthy, well-adjusted, regular, or normal might be used. Note that the term normal is a lot like Catholic in its original sense of Catholic. It's what the majority does. Although in some ways it's more consistent than the notion of Catholic. We all know that the majority of people lie. That doesn't make it moral to lie, but it does make it normal to lie <laughs> in the West. Normal is generally determined, or generally thought to be determined, by some sort of observation. Note that I do not say empirically for a reason that I will come back to, but it is thought to be determined by observation. By and large, the standard of what is normal is set by the academic and particularly by the scientific and medical communities. 
The equivalent in the modern world of a Catholic decision of a council is what nine out of 10 doctors say. <laughs> this has just about the same force in the modern world as what a Catholic decision did. Psychiatry is the authority for the psychically normal and medicine is the authority for the corporeally normal. There is no exact equivalent in the modern world for um, the ancient world's good citizenship or Catholic world's orthodox. The closest thing we have in a public sphere, normal being more or less the private sphere, is the word loyal. The closest we have to good citizenship is being loyal to your country or loyal to a government or loyal to a system like capitalism or communism or even Catholicism. As long as you are normal in the modern world, you are generally assumed to be loyal. But if you are abnormal, you may then have to prove your loyalty, for instance, to the House on American Activities or some similar <laughs> body like that. I'm going to expand on the modern system presently. Now what I want to do is go back through the divisions I set up, and I'm going to try to use as an example of the effect that these systems have on real living people one of the minorities in my title, either Jews or gay people. And I'm going to invite you to figure out which one I'm describing. I think the effort of trying to figure out which one I'm describing will disclose a lot of interesting things to you. In the ancient world, the group that I'm describing flourishes. They are recognized as distinctive by some of their fellow citizens and some writers. They are not thought to be distinctive by others. Likewise, they themselves are divided. Some of them consider themselves a special group. Others don't see that they are in any way particularly special. They suffer no legal disadvantages. There is very rarely popular animus against them. And when there is popular animus, it is usually only against specific things they do, not against them as a category of people. They are citizens everywhere in the ancient world, influential, prominent in much of the ancient world. By almost universal consent, they can have both arete and can be good citizens. The only problem that arises in relation to them is a problem of exclusiveness, to which I will come back. In Catholic Europe, under the notion of Catholic truth and morals, that is, the behavior of the majority as some sort of divine standard, this group does experience some difficulty. At first, the difficulty is limited to a few writers, mostly fanatics, who feel that this group is necessarily rejecting the truth of the Christian community by being different from other people. They are not Catholic. Some of these critics rail harshly against them, saying that it's improper for Christians even to associate with them because of their theological and moral wrongs, and because they are different from other people in nature. St. John Chrysostom, to be more specific, says that this group is possessed by evil spirits. Debauchery and drunkenness have brought them to the level of goats and pigs. They are concerned only to satisfy their desires. They are murderers and violent. Isn't it interesting that you can't tell from that description which group he's talking about? His complaints seem to have nothing to do with the real nature of either of those groups. Justinian and Theodosius limit their freedom following a trend of earlier Roman laws which had restricted their access to public office. Some literature depicts them as threats to the children of the majority. But in general, they continue to fare well through the 11th century of the Christian era. It is generally assumed that they have their own truth and their own virtue, and that they can be moral, even if they are different from the majority of people. In the 10th through the 12th centuries, they are very prominent and influential at many levels of European society. They have considerable influence on religious and intellectual developments. They play a great role in the revival of learning and literature, and the importation of Aristotelian science, which is called by medievalists the Renaissance of the 12th century. Many of them are much admired by their contemporaries, even though they are acknowledged to be distinctive. I have to point out at this point that the divisions I'm describing are not neat. Almost no human divisions are neat, and especially in the ancient world, changes in social structures didn't sweep over Europe the way a disco craze now sweeps over the United States. It took a long time, and changes came slowly. Um, a lot of these, these systems overlap. In Catholic Europe, the older notion of conformity to the state overlapped with the newer notion of orthodoxy in both truth and virtue, and the two were blended often. There are two main reasons for this blending. 
One is that the Catholic religion took over the Roman state and replaced it in much of Europe. And the second is that people in many societies retain older ideologies and blend them with new ones. This is characteristic, especially of the classes below the top in many societies. A lot of Christianity, as many of you doubtless already know, is simply older religious and social structures with new names. Many of you probably already know that Christmas is the renaming of a holiday traditionally for Mithra. Um, often Christians took statues of Venus and Cupid and just renamed them statues of the Madonna and Child. And a lot of Christianity is just an adaptation of existing structures. By the 13th century, the con there was a considerable confusion of not being part of the whole in religious matters and not being in conformity with the state. So that many people imagined that being a bad Catholic meant that one was a bad citizen. Rejecting the religion of the state meant to many people necessarily rejecting the state. By and large, I would say that the upper classes re resisted this and argued that people who were not entirely correct religiously might still be good citizens and might have their own virtues. But the lower class increasingly linked orthodoxy with being a good citizen. And under this conflation, the group I'm describing begins to have real trouble, especially in the 13th century. They are increasingly seen as willfully and obstinately refusing to be part of the general welfare. Resisting the truth seems obviously to people to be resisting the common good. Isn't the truth the common good? They are seen as dangerously different. Often they are said to be suffering from incurable diseases. Laws are passed to prevent them from having contact with Orthodox Catholics. Increasingly, they are required by law either to behave as Orthodox Catholics themselves or to be exiled or, in some cases, put to death. Whereas only about 100 years before, they had been prominent and respected in much of Europe, from 1250 to 1350, nearly every civil code in Europe penalized them or restricted their freedom in some way, often drastically. The first, third, and fourth Lateran councils passed canon laws restricting their freedom or condemning them. They were mentioned in law codes along with arsonists, traitors, and murderers. Moral texts begin to compare them to murderers and cannibals and to suggest that their nonconformity is particularly heinous. Literary texts depict them as immoral animals and a threat to Christian children. Extreme distortions about them and savage stereotypes appear. It is said that they look different from good or normal people. Eventually, they disappear from Europe altogether for centuries. It's easy to see the events of this period from the 13th to about the 16th century as involving rank bigotry. But in fact, that would be, in an illusory way, self-congratulatory. It is much more complicated than that. In fact, it was a terrible quandary for people, even very sincere, good-hearted people, to decide what the Christian state should do about people who are resisting the plain truth. What to do with people who reject values of the state. This is not an easy question to answer, even for us today. It had not been a problem in the ancient world because the state was the only value of public concern. Private issues were not a public concern. If you helped the state, if you did what was necessary, were good citizens, served in the army, paid your taxes, whatever, that was all you needed to have done. But what happens when the state has another set of values, a more absolute set of values, a set of values over and above just being a good citizen? that is, Christian values. If you believe those values are really true, what should the state do about people who reject them? In the Middle Ages, they had no clear answer, and I would suggest to you that we don't have any clear answer today. The reason it doesn't vex us as much as it vexed people in the 14th century is that, to a certain extent, the specific religious problem went away. The problem of resisting religious truth was muddled by the breakdown of the unified Catholic religious tradition at the time of the Protestant Reformation. By the end of the 16th century, although individual Christians were more certain than ever that they knew the absolute truth, Europe as a whole no longer had a single religion. It was now a very diverse religious picture, and the problem of dealing with people who resisted the truth faded away to a certain extent under the pressure of religious pluralism. In order to be able to pursue your absolute religious truth, you had to let your neighbor pursue his absolute religious truth. It did not, however, disappear in a moral sphere. Although Christians couldn't agree on many theological matters, there was a certain degree of agreement morally. And even today, in this very city, people would argue that certain private acts should not be tolerated. 
not because they harm the state or the public good or any living individuals, but because they are inherently evil, according to a particular set of moral values, and it is the job of the state to defend what is really good and to oppose what is really bad, according to a set of values not related to the public good, but to some higher system. Now, how does the group I'm discussing fare under the modern standards I described to you? Well, it has really violent ups and downs. Sometimes the group is fully accepted, sometimes it is savagely oppressed. Even within the same society, there will be a wide range of opinion depending on many factors. A few decades can bring a complete reversal in the position of the group. One European country can be very tolerant and another violently hostile at the same time or within only a few years. There is less disease imagery about the group in question at the moment. There is more degeneracy imagery in the 20th century. Their state is depicted as being a congenital defect or as involving inferiority to the majority through inheritance. In hostile areas, the group I'm describing is often considered to be different by nature. In tolerant areas, just different, but having their own notions and their own ability to achieve virtue. There are common stereotypes in the 20th century left over from previous ages, the idea that the group in question is a threat to the well-being of children or to the race or to the state, that they are animalistic in some way or immoral. There is, in fact, in the modern world, a triple conflation, like the double conflation I suggested about the Catholic world. The older notions of good citizenship and orthodoxy are often subsumed in the modern world under the rubrics of normal and loyal. Abnormal does not mean to most of the population in the modern world just diverging from a statistical mean or not exhibiting the most common characteristics. It means to most people diverging from what ought to be. And you can see that this is a conflation with Catholic morals. Having blue eyes, being celibate, being unusually intelligent are all abnormal. But they're not the kind of things you would tend to describe as abnormal. You reserve the word abnormal to describe something that isn't what it should be, not what isn't most common. And if you diverge from what ought to be, you do not belong in the state in the eyes of many. It is dangerous for the state to tolerate abnormality. People who are abnormal are apt to be disloyal, immoral, unorthodox. The new term rests on old categories, in other words, I'm arguing, to a large extent for much of society, even if those at the top understand it in a more limited sense. Sometimes the top decides who to apply it to. That is to say, psychologists or doctors may decide who to apply the term abnormal to, but the populace then draws its own conclusions about the moral and political significance of normality. They may be willing to take scientific advice on what or whom to consider normal, but they then make up their own minds about whether to tolerate them in schools or in their society or what to do. One of the most interesting and, to my point of view, disturbing aspects of this is that many people are willing to believe about themselves that they are abnormal, just as many people apparently were willing to believe in the past that they were not virtuous or did not have the truth as revealed through the vote of a council. I don't know how many of you will already have guessed which group I was talking about. Uh, in fact, I was talking about both groups all along at every point. Everything I said was true, both about gay people and about Jews. The similarities in their treatment are absolutely amazing. The same writers, like John Chrysostom, said exactly the same things, word for word in the Greek, about both groups. The same laws passed by Justinian, Theodosius, high medieval law codes mention Jews and gay people often in the same sentence, not just in the same part of the law code. Arsonists, murderers, traitors, Jews, and sodomites was a standard list of immoral or unacceptable people in 13th century law codes. The same moral arguments were used against them. They had rejected the truth, either theological truth or moral truth or both. In some way, both groups had done this because they were different. You might imagine that it would be hard to apply disease imagery to Jews, but that's not true at all. Solomon Ibn Verga, a Jew himself, reports that in his day, as late as the 16th century, contemporaries of his believed that Judaism was an incurable disease. <laughs> and many people from the 11th century on believed that homosexuality was a disease. Albertus Magnus describes very specifically that it's a disease that is especially common among the wealthy. 
<laughs> My book, which John mentioned, was originally conceived, in fact, as a long-sustained comparison of the position of Jews and gay people in Western society. For various reasons, I decided mostly space. I decided in the end not to do that. But I still think it would have made an extremely effective discussion of many of the problems of majority-minority relations. Now, if we could go back just for a few minutes to these three periods and considering another way of looking at the status of gay people and Jews, I think you'll see that this also helps to understand what's going on. I want to suggest three categories excuse me, of difference, which can be used to look at the effect of the social standards I've been discussing on the well-being of minorities. The first category of difference is what I would call different but equal. People who are different but equal are viewed as part of the normal range of human variation. In this category, in this society, for instance, among the people in this room, would come some of the things I mentioned before, unusual intelligence, hair color, eye color, being left-handed, those things make you different but equal in American society. The classic example in American society is what brand of Protestant you are. The Presbyterians may think the Methodists are going to hell, but they would not suggest for a minute that they shouldn't be allowed to go to the same public schools or shouldn't be elected to the city council or whatever. It's the classic example in the United States of different but equal. The differences matter in personal lives, but at the public level, it's different but equal. The same has not always been true of Jews and Catholics, but Protestantism is the classic example. I suspect in Wisconsin there are enough Protestants for this analogy to be useful. Um, in New Haven, it doesn't always work. Um, the second category I would describe is inferior insider. This is a very important category, an important distinction to apprehend. Inferior insiders are people who are viewed as part of the normal range of human difference and adaptation. But because of the way they are different from the majority or from the controlling element in the society, they are relegated to lower status. The classic example of inferior insider, I am sorry to say, in most of the world, is women. Nobody imagines that it's morally wrong to be a woman. Women are indispensable to the human race, but because women are women in much of the world, they are relegated to an inferior position. In many places, racial minorities are in inferior insider status status, and probably the most prominent association in anyone's mind with what I would call inferior insider status, is the untouchables in the caste system of India. It's part of the great karma that there should be untouchables. Nobody suggests they should be driven out of society, but being an untouchable deprives them of access to most of the goods that we would value in the society. The third category is outsider. Outsiders are people who either are not tolerated at all, that is to say they suffer punishment, exile, death, or violence, or they are marginal in such a way that they risk violence at any time. They don't have protection. They don't have a guaranteed status. Society might turn on them at any time and punish them, exile them, or execute some kind of violence against them. The ancient world generally placed Jews and gay people in category one, different but equal. There was no reason to relegate them to any inferior status since they could possess arete and they could be good citizens. There were many religions in the ancient world. Jews brushed against followers of Mithra, Isis, Sibyl, Zoroaster, the Greek and Roman pantheon. It was OK in most of the ancient world to worship anyone you pleased as long as you were a good citizen. There was a problem with emperor worship, but that's much exaggerated. You can ask me about that later if you want. By and large, you could worship anybody you wanted. St. Paul, for instance, was a Jewish Roman citizen. When the Roman soldiers became aware that he was Hebrew but spoke Greek and was a Roman citizen, they were a little surprised. But once it was clearly established that he was a Roman citizen, he got the same treatment as any other Roman citizen. There is no hint that he was a second class citizen because he was a Jew. Likewise, the characteristic attitude of the ancient world towards gay people was separate but equal. A poem that seems to me to embody this is a poem which goes, Zeus came as an eagle to God like Ganymede, as a swan to the fair-haired mother of Helen. There is no comparison between the two things. One person likes one, another likes the other. That is, Ganymede is gay, Helen is straight. One person likes one, another person likes the other. 
Sometimes separate but equal went to the point of being even separate but superior. Um, some of you may know that in Aristophanes' speech in the symposium, he says that gay people, in fact, make the best statesmen. Men who pursue the masculine and delight to lie with men and be embraced by men have the most manly nature. On reaching maturity, they alone prove in a public career to be men. I think this is a bit of an exaggeration, but it shows, <laughs> shows very clearly a separate but equal notion. Even in Catholic Europe, often both groups belonged to one, this first category, which may surprise you. Often there was separate but equal status. A lot of very pious Christian leaders, like Louis the Pious, for instance, had special officials who watched over the well-being of the Jews. Louis the Pious, who was a very devout Christian and thought there was only one true faith, nonetheless had a magister judeorum, a master of the Jews who watched out for them. When Bishop Agobard of Lyon preached against the Jews, he exiled him. A deacon at Louis' court converted to Judaism and was allowed to go away in peace. There was a lot of admiration in many circles for Jews. In the 11th and 12th centuries, we find the expression Hebraica veritas in a lot of Christian writings, an acknowledgment of the fact that the Jews had the truth of the Hebrew scriptures long before anyone else and in the truest language. It was a different truth from the Christian truth, but it was a truth. Often in medieval documents, one finds as an expression for the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Islam, the law of Moses, the law of Christ, and the law of Muhammad, suggesting that there are three separate things. The same even was true about gay people, which may surprise you. Um, much of my book is about this, and so I'm not going to go through all that again, but I will give you a couple of examples of things that I've discovered since my book. One is I've discovered a lot of pairs of gay saints. The most prominent were a pair of saints called Serge and Bacchus, who were soldiers in the Roman army. Uh, they were very highly revered by a pagan emperor under whom they served, so highly revered that people became envious of them and denounced them to the emperor as being Christians. The, yes, um, the Christian biographer who records their life says explicitly that they are lovers erastai, um, but this is not at issue in the account of their martyrdom. They're denounced to the emperor. The emperor asks them as proof of their loyalty to sacrifice to pagan deities. They refuse to do so. To pun the emperor is enraged. He's lavished so much affection and honor on them, and they won't worship his gods. So to punish them, he has them dressed in women's clothes, chained together, and paraded through the city. Um, now, I want to emphasize to you that being dressed in women's clothes has nothing to do with their being gay. There was not an association of effeminacy with homosexuality in a world in which the three most prominent gay men were Hercules, <laughs> uh, emperors like Hadrian, um, and probably Julius Caesar. Um, these were archetypally masculine men. The reason that they were dressed in women's clothes was that it, would, it was thought that this would degrade them as soldiers to be dressed in women's clothes. But no, search and Bacchus were not degraded at all. They are paraded through the city. The biographer says that they sang in unison psalms as with one voice. And they say, we are not humiliated to be dressed as women because we are the brides of Christ and the brides of each other. They are then martyred one by one, um, and when one is left alone in his cell and the other one has already died, they die horrible deaths. I couldn't even bring myself to describe to you what is done to them. Um, one is left alone in his cell and the other has died, and for the first time, the one begins to have doubts and think, is it really worth it to go all through this? And the other one appears to him in a vision, and the Christian saints like written in Greek about this says, he appeared to him in a vision radiantly beautiful, and says to him, stick it out. If you stick it out till the end, you will get me as a reward. <laughs> it's really, really a very striking passage in early Christian hagiography because romantic love, personal affection between people is not prominent in any saint's lives, um, straight or gay. Surgeon Bacchus became the model for a gay marriage ceremony, which was widely practiced in much of Catholic Europe from, well, much of the Catholic world, how much of Europe I'm still working out, from probably as early as the fourth or fifth century until the 1940s, in which two men or two women were married in a Catholic church by a Catholic priest, holding crowns over each other's heads, just the way people do in an Eastern Orthodox ceremony. I've been working on this for a number of years, and I have about 80 different manuscripts of this ceremony. Even in areas where the marriage ceremony wasn't common, there was still often an idea of separate but equal. For instance, in medieval Europe, there were debates about which was better, gay or straight love. Um, in two out of three of the surviving debates, the gay side wins. <laughs> 
Sometimes, however, in these societies, gay people and Jews were insiders with inferior status. In the ancient world, when this happened, it was often related to exclusiveness. When Jews would not acknowledge the public religious sentiments of Rome, or when they refused to interact socially with the Romans, they earned contempt. Then they were regarded as inferior insiders. They were still part of the normal order of the world. Jews were part of the Roman world, but they were thought to be inferior citizens if they would not participate fully in Roman life, which included the Roman religion. Likewise, exclusive homosexual behavior, you know, we're just not discussing desire here, but exclusive homosexual behavior, interacting erotically only with males, was sometimes thought to be inferior, either because producing an heir was a duty to the state, and this was difficult through exclusive homosexual behavior, <laughs> uh, or because passive sexual behavior in men was thought to be feminine, and since women were excluded from many of the duties and privileges of citizenship, a man by analogy was then thought to be inferior if he imitated female sexual roles. It was not horrible or disgusting for a man to be like a woman in this context. It just wasn't as good in the rather sexist view of the society. In this context, gay men were inferior insiders, like perhaps a servant in a household. It's not bad to be a servant. It's just not as good as being the owner of the house. Now, this type two, inferior insider, was probably most common in Western Europe to the 12th century. One separate but equal is probably more common in Eastern Europe in those areas. The idea was about Jews that they don't have the complete truth, but they have some truth. As I mentioned, the idea of the law of Moses, the law of Christ, and the law of Muhammad was a commonplace. This suggested that the Jews were following a law. The law of Christ might be better, but they had a law. Likewise, although gay people were not part of a society which was largely structured around heterosexual unions through which property was transmitted, they were not thought to be harming anyone in much of Europe through about the 12th century. A common word for gay people during this period was Ganymede. Ganymede wasn't a saint, but he was sort of a cute, harmless figure, kind of sweet, and he didn't uh, threaten the state in any way. It was only with the conflation of orthodoxy and good citizenship that I described before that both groups finally become outsiders. So that Jews are listed as criminals. There is only one law from the 13th century on, the law of the Christian state. And the Jews rejecting it are rejecting all law. They are therefore lawless or outsiders. Likewise, the common term for gay people becomes sodomites evoking an image of the destruction of a lawless city rather than a harmless deified youth. Stereotypes appear in which Jews are depicted not as people with a different set of laws, but as lawless, avaricious people who kill Christian children, try to seduce Christians to Judaism, who look different. Gay people are depicted as more lustful than heterosexual people, also as abusing children and trying to subvert the natural order. Now, if you consider the modern standard, one might have expected, because we often congratulate ourselves on living in more liberal ages, medieval, after all, is almost synonymous in many people's minds with unenlightened or gauche or primitive. One might have expected that the modern standard would be more tolerant, but I want to suggest to you that I think in many ways the modern standard is less tolerant than either of the two older standards. The modern standard tends to make people automatically outsiders and to preclude inferior insiders because the modern standard tends to be either or. You either are normal or you're not. It is normal now to be Jewish in the United States. It is not still normal to be gay. It was definitely not normal to be Jewish in Germany or much of Europe 40 years ago. Generally, Jews have achieved normal status more than gays in the modern West, and I want now to address the question why that might be and to see what insight that would give us in this whole process. Of course, for the sake of honest inquiry, we must first consider the possibility that Jews are normal and gay people aren't. I don't mean to suggest that simply because there are parallels and they suffered the same fate, that there are necessarily no differences between them. On the other hand, I'm not prepared to say who's normal and who isn't, and I'm not sure I buy the modern standard of personal and public good any more than ancient ones. What I actually want to do in this section is to raise questions about all three standards. I can't comment on which are better, since I don't know any more about the true and the good and the beautiful than you do, but I can suggest some things about their ideology, about their formulation, 
and about their internal consistency or lack thereof, which may give you a clearer perception of where they come from and how they operate, and perhaps point to a reason why Jews achieved normal status before gay people in modern culture, even though the two groups started out together and their histories were almost identical for about 1,600 years. It's not very hard for you to see right off what some of the problems with R.A.T. are, since almost all of the philosophical schools of the ancient world disagreed about what R.A.T. was. It was a very difficult and subjective concept. And it's also not very hard what to see to see what's wrong with the idea of good citizenship in governments called democracies, in which only landholding freeborn males participate in the government. The Catholic tradition would seem to have removed some of these inequities relating to individual power and differences relating to R.I.T., and to have introduced a more common notion of personal good, affecting a larger group of people and enfranchising more. The clever among you, however, will have already apprehended the fact that the Catholic tradition isn't according to the whole at all. It is only according to a small percentage of Christian males in holy orders. At the absolute most, it's according to half the whole, Kathemi Holon, if you excuse a bad Greek pun. <laughs> but it affects how the whole of society sees things because it sets standards to which everyone must refer. Even people who disagree with these standards have to disagree with these standards, if you see the point I'm making. It promulgates metaphors, and metaphors determine how we view reality to a very large extent, and by determining how we view reality to an even larger extent, they view what they determine what reality is. Of many examples of how this operates in medieval Europe and informs the Western tradition, which we all inherited even in very Protestant sections of the country, um, let me suggest only a couple. One of the most interesting examples, I think, and often hardest to detect, is the way in which conceptual systems of gender, organized usually by males, supposedly Catholic, um, by males around male-female polarity, the way in which these systems run not from one reality, femaleness, to its complementary other, maleness, but instead run from a single reality, maleness, to the absence of that reality, which is femaleness. That is to say, in much of Western thought during the formative years of the Western tradition that we've already, that we've all inherited, the female gender represents not the complement or correlate of the male, as it would in a system of real sexual differences, but simply the negation or absence of the masculine. Feminine behavior is conceived not cheaply as behavior suitable to females and to their sexuality, but as behavior unsuitable to males. Often, in fact, it's behavior unsuitable to any human being. Often what is feminine is cowardice, weakness, self-indulgence, lassitude, vacillation, excessive passion, or uncontrolled emotion. These are depicted as feminine, rather than traits which might really be projected as the complements of supposedly masculine characteristics. I'm not sure that I believe in any of these divisions, but suppose for the sake of discussion, we said that a masculine characteristic is aggressiveness. The feminine correlate might then be, let's say, nurturing or sensitivity, but instead the feminine correlate is usually lack of aggressiveness. It isn't a positive quality at all, but a negation. Femininity is simply the negation of masculine positive values, which shows that it isn't really a scale of sexual differences, but simply arbitrary poles created by males in a basically male system. The negative of feminine is generally excuse me, the negative of manly or masculine is generally unmanly or perhaps effeminate. Effeminate is a word whose very existence is evidence of the odd polarity I'm describing. The metaphor is so powerful and so difficult to resist that if a real case seems to contradict it, if a woman demonstrates masculine characteristics or a man demonstrates feminine characteristics, the real individuals are redefined rather than the metaphorical categories. If a woman displays a kind of courage not associated with women, she is said to be manly. No one considers revising the category feminine to include that kind of courage. If a man weeps or demonstrates sensitivity not thought to be part of the masculine sensibility, he is redefined as effeminate or womanly, rather than being used to broaden the category masculine. The most shocking example of this, and more closely related to the things I've been talking about, is the following. It is the word which encapsulates the whole Christian moral system. It is 
virtue. I don't know how many of you will ever have thought of this, but the word virtue is the English version of the Latin word virtus, which comes from the Latin word vir, which means male as opposed to female, not human as opposed to animal, not person as opposed to something else. It means male as opposed to female. Its correlate would be muliertus, I guess. The moral touchstone of Christianity is virtus, which means manliness. It is hardly surprising that many Christian writers should find women lacking this quality. <laughs> <laughs> or that even now, Catholic leaders should argue that women do not have the virtues of Christ and therefore cannot be priests. How could women have the maleness of Christ? They could have every other quality. Imagine how different the Catholic moral tradition might have been if women had been part of the decision-making process in the beginning, if it had really been Catholic. I submit that the whole notion of virtue would probably have been considerably different. There would probably have been positive female values in a really Catholic system. I think myself that if women's views had been included, the whole issue of gender would have been vastly less important. I don't think Christ's virtues would have been the crucial matter if women had voted at councils. There is, moreover, absolutely no reason that women should have been excluded from voting from councils. No matter how you feel about ordination of women to the priesthood, persons other than priests were often excluded at councils, either because they were heads of religious orders or they were prominent theologians. There's no reason that women could not have been included in either category. It is not a rule that only bishops can vote at councils. Women were president at present at Pentecost, extremely influential all during Christ's life, but they are gradually excluded from the Catholic tradition in an amazing irony, and their exclusion severely distorts the view of what it means to be a Christian or even a good person. Catholicism changes basic notions of religion and sexual orientation, as well as notions of gender in this way. The ancient world had had a widespread notion of being born into a religion, this idea was very strong in Judaism and is today in many Jewish families and many Jewish um, communities. Christianity introduces the rather novel idea that you just choose a religion and you do so on a grand scale. You're given a birth after the fact. You aren't born into Christianity. You choose Christianity and then you're given a birth, which is baptism, um, as opposed to the Jewish custom, which is you're born first and then you're a Jew. Um, the Christian custom, you're a Christian first and then you're born. This makes it appear to Christians that everyone chooses his or her religion and that Jews have chosen the wrong religion. Now, in fact, it's not true. Most Christians, I would say that 95% of all Christians who ever live are Christian because they were born into Christian cultures and into Christian families. I dare say that 60% of the people in this room are whatever religion they are because that's what religion their parents are or a spouse is or something like that. It isn't a question of just out of all the religions of the world you choose the one you want to be. I bet there are very few Baha'i in here, for instance. Um, in fact, it is the Christian idea that people just choose their religion is not true. Nearly all Jews in Catholic Europe felt that they were Jewish whether they wanted to be or not. And a sad irony is that the Jewish perception was, in the end, more accurate than the Catholic pretense, because when Jews converted to Christianity to avoid the severe penalties imposed on them for having chosen the wrong religion, in most cultures, for instance, like medieval Spain or under Nazi Germany, they were still Jews. It didn't do any good to choose Christianity, even though what they were being blamed for was having chosen Judaism. The Catholic notion prevails in the sense that religion seems to be a choice and people are blamed for making the wrong choice, but it isn't really a choice for most people and Jews are punished even when they have made supposedly the right choice because they were born Jews. The same is true of gay people to a considerable extent. In the ancient world, under separate but equal notions of religion and sexuality, there was a general presumption that people were born with attraction either to the opposite gender, their own gender, or to both genders. The passage I read you from Aristophanes in the Symposium is the clearest example of this, but there are many others. It might be less desirable to be, for instance, an exclusively passive male, but at worst you were an inferior insider. Aristotle says that when nature is responsible for this disposition, 
nobody would hold these men to blame any more than they would blame women because they take a role in intercourse different from that of men. As late as Aquinas, Orthodox writers had the position that homosexuality was natural to some people. But the triumph of a purely functional approach to sexuality in general, ignoring affectional preference or any kind of innate inclination, in fact, ignoring inclination altogether, and arguing that the touchstone of sexuality is choosing to have sex only for purely procreative purposes. This caused a great confusion and conflation. Love and orientation were taken out of the equation, and people were considered to be making the wrong choice. They were blamed in the way the Jews were for making the wrong choice. But there was the same catch-22. Once you had made the wrong choice and had a homosexual relationship, you were permanently a sodomite. It wasn't like making the wrong choice and masturbating. There's no word in Western cultures that signifies a special class of people that masturbate or that practice birth control, which is equally prohibited under procreative sexual rules. But there's a special permanent category for sodomites even though what sodomites are being blamed for is simply a single choice of having done the wrong thing. This is why Jews and gay people could sometimes be prosecuted as heretics. The root meaning of heretic is to choose. They are choosing an individual and wrong way against the kapolon, but by a curious conflation and recognition of the older categories, it puts them into a permanent division. I don't have enough time to examine the modern standard making in great detail, and I'm going to limit myself about the modern system to three points. The first point is that the focus of the modern system has changed, not its inclusiveness. This is why, to get back to a question I raised, Jews have generally been perceived as normal earlier than gay people in Western culture. It is not because Judaism is now better understood it is not because we have a better definition of religion now, which takes more account of Jewish notions of what religion is, or other non-Christian experiences of religion. And, incidentally, in case you're wondering about this, I don't think it's because there are so many Jews now involved in the decision-making process about what's normal and what isn't. It isn't because there are a lot of Jew Jewish psychiatrists. I don't think that has a lot to do with it. I think it's actually relatively simple. The reason that Jews achieve normal status before gay people is that religion is no longer part of the study of the normal. Religion itself is now either abnormal, extra-normal, or paranormal. <laughs> the bodies that rule on normality are either uninterested in or afraid to take on religion. And it is simply not a matter of discussion. The second point I want to make about the modern system is what I call circular empiricism. Many of these systems imagine they are empirical. If you think about Aristotle and slaves, something that many of you will know, um, Aristotle says that slaves lack arete because they're slaves. People in a servile condition couldn't have arete. When he's asked how people get into servile condition, he says, because they don't have arete. <laughs> It's a perfect circle. Actually, there was a Mississippi politician who said that people were black because God was punishing them. And this is true, I'm not making this up. When he was asked what they were being punished for, he said, well, for being black. <laughs> a similar thing takes place even among scholars, for instance, in relation to Jews in the Middle Ages. Even modern scholars will sometimes sort of hint that the reason Jews had so much trouble in the Middle Ages is because so many of them were merchants and moneylenders. And this sort of seems to be a little sign of greed, you know. They really kind of brought it on themselves by demanding exorbitant interest from the Christians. You, you know, it's not nice to react against the Jews, but they were demanding all that interest. How many people ask themselves, why did Jews lend money and interest? Incidentally, far more Christians were money lenders than Jews, but there were Jews who lent money and interest. Why? Because Jews were prohibited from owning land or having Christian servants or exercising most of the, the occupations that the Christians exercised. So they are blamed for something into which they are forced. A similar thing happens in relation to gay people in a way that I think gay people themselves often don't even apprehend. One of the main things that modern Western society blames gay people for, even when it can get over the issue of gender choice, is that gay people are promiscuous and they don't form stable relationships. And why might gay people be promiscuous and not form gay relationships? Why wouldn't they take advantage of marriage ceremonies, which are available to them everywhere, or of all the support that society affords gay couples? 
nothing is more dangerous for two men than to go on seeing each other in a society that doesn't accept homosexuality. Nobody knows where you go late at night or who happens to sleep over at your house one night, but every day, every week, every month, every year that you are seen with the same man is more suspicious. <laughs> Even many tolerant people draw the line at the idea that there might be gay marriages. And yet, society, having afforded gay people not only no support for, but not even room for forming unions. Yale does not recognize same-sex couples. Um, affording no support for same-sex couples at all, then blames gay people for being promiscuous. At the time of the AIDS crisis, I don't think I need to point out to you how many people think that God would blame gay people for being promiscuous. The third point I want to make about the modern system is that many points of view are just as absent from the consensus-making bodies in the modern world, the bodies which determine normality, as they were from the bodies that determined either good citizenship in the ancient world or call on morality in the Catholic world. And I am pretty sure that the results are similar, that the modern notions of normal are just as distorted as, let's say, the call on notion of virtus is. This is most notably true about women, I don't know how it is here, but I teach in a department of 60 faculty members, of whom three are women. Now, this affects how everyone perceives everything. I'm going to give you an example of this, which is very slightly off color, and I'm going to phrase it as delicately as I possibly can. I have chosen this example not to titillate you, but, although I don't mind if you're titillated, but <laughs> I've chosen it because it's an example of something that many of you would not have thought about before, and my whole point is to show you how whole points of view would be completely missing. You wouldn't even have noticed that these points of view might not be in your perception of things. A colleague of mine suggested to me after reading my book, this is a medieval book, that um, I had missed really the whole issue about gay people in Western society. The real problem isn't gender at all, he said. People don't care what gender you sleep with. The real problem is catchers and pitchers. Now, for those of you who haven't thought about this before, catchers and pitchers is prison slang. I really wonder where my friend heard this, but <laughs> catchers and pitchers is prison slang for a dichotomy that more wicked people in underground newspapers, um, personal ads, would describe as French active, French passive, Greek active, Greek passive. It basically relates to, in a male-male sexual encounter, the transmission of fluids. The donor of the fluids being the pitcher, and the recipient of the fluids being the catcher. Wasn't that delicate? <laughs> my friend suggested, my friend being a very heterosexual male, suggested that the problem everywhere is catchers. People don't care about pitchers. They are not shocked about a man's pitching to anyone. What they care about is catchers. It's not really that someone is gay that bothers anybody, but everywhere in the world, people are shocked, even disgusted is the word I think he would use, by men who are catchers. This took me completely by surprise. <laughs> I asked him if he had ever known a catcher himself. Um, needless to say, he had never known a catcher. Well, in fact, he had, but he didn't know it. Um, <laughs> not aware of having ever known any catchers. I tried to point out to him that the prison population is composed mostly of heterosexual males. The number of gay men in prison is even below the na national average. Most of the heterosexual males in prison are doubtless used to pitching, since they are heterosexual males, and it's much easier for heterosexual males to pitch than to do anything else. They doubtless mostly regard catching as demeaning, disgusting, abnormal. And in fact, in prison, where most of the people forced to catch are heterosexual males who wouldn't do this by preference, it is mostly demeaning and perhaps even disgusting. But gay men, both pitchers and catchers, probably feel somewhat differently about it. Presumably, pitchers are grateful for catchers, and most of the catchers I know are delighted to catch and don't feel that, in fact, regarded as an opportunity. <laughs> and don't feel that it is in any way degrading or demeaning. What I think is going on here, if you can see what I mean, is that a point of view is totally absent from public discourse, even from private discourse. 
how many of you would have thought of the problem of a catcher's viewpoint about the way, let's say, things go on in prison? I have a suspicion that many of the various scientific, academic, and popular bodies which establish, either directly or indirectly, our notions of what's normal are like the prison population, or like my friends, and like the Catholic councils, that is to say, they extrapolate with unassailable logic and great sensitivity from a sample which is not representative at all, and on the basis of feelings which they imagine to be universal, but which are not by any means universal. This brings me back to the Chinese encyclopedia, with which I began my talk. So if you're melting, you can take comfort in the fact that I'm near the end. <laughs> it will have occurred to you that the point of the Chinese encyclopedia is to show, or well, the reason I quoted it to you, is to show that what seems to one person an obvious set of categories could seem to someone else arbitrary, capricious, or in fact meaningless. Those 14 categories are one way of organizing animals. Possibly they would have seemed intuitive to the author, but in another place and time, under different assumptions, they seem ludicrous or meaningless. Zoological taxonomy doesn't affect humans very much, and my guess is that if animals are aware of it at all, they're too smart to care. <laughs> <laughs> but standards of personal and public good, as I've been trying to show this evening, affect people a lot. These standards can also come to seem capricious and arbitrary as newer ones replace older ones, um, and as different systems of social or intellectual organization come into play. Some of this may have occurred to you before. What may not have occurred to you, at least not in this context, is that you either are or will be the 20th century councils who determine the equivalent of Catholic and truth. And that just as the bishops were often surprised and even dismayed to discover that the limited truths they gathered to discuss in preparation for the life to come took on a force, sometimes a horrifying force involving people's deaths in this life among the population at large, I think you might want to think about the social impact of standards that you set wittingly or unwittingly in things you say or as some of you go out to become doctors or lawyers or some of you sit in academic councils and rule on what's normal and what's not. Incidentally, the 14 categories are not actually a Chinese encyclopedia at all. Um, this little tidbit was invented by the Latin American poet Borges to make just the point I'm making. He claimed it was a Chinese encyclopedia to give an aura of authority to it. Most capricious and discriminating taxonomies are invented on as little authority as this, and most of them pretend to be ancient and authoritative. It seems to me that it's the duty of everyone who's interested in the well-being of the human community to make sure that this kind of arbitrary and invidious distinction does not rob some of the members of society of their place or their dignity. And perhaps even more important, doesn't rob the larger community of the unique insights and viewpoints that such people might contribute by discriminating against them because of their religion, their sexual orientation, their gender, or because they ride bicycles. And <laughs> an honored medieval tradition to seek the truth through a series of carefully phrased questions and answers, and I'm sure I'm not wrong in suggesting that Dr. Boswell would be willing to engage in such time-honored practice. Yes. 
in the process of finding some truth, uh, those of us that have had to interact with Christianity at times, of course, against the Bible. Paul Hart, who was editor of a magazine in San Francisco, about 82 or 83, had a funny column about gay, gay historical persons. He brought up an issue in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I think it is the part, it's a wonderful little three, three part comparison. And it's in the introduction of the fourth Beatitude, something like, and it says, the word is that is used is the word raka. And I know every time I read the Bible, especially some of the translations we have, that if there's something that is kept in its original language, it means that there's been some problems with dealing with it, or some honor given to it. For instance, the issue of Rabuni. Rabuni is usually kept in the revised standard original life. But anyway, so there's this word raka. And it goes, one of the translations, I don't know if it's mine or not, but it says, you will not speak unkindly of your Raka, or the judgment of the council will be against you. Paul Hart suggests, and I don't see any reason to dispute it, that the word Raka means queers. It's a familiar form in the Aramaic or whatever. So you will not speak, speak unkindly of your queers, or the judgment of the council will be against you. Have you run into this? Yes. Um. <laughs> This was first suggested by Yoel Arbeitman in um, a journal article, and it's been discussed about three or four times in fairly serious linguistic contexts. The translation I'm most familiar with says, whoever calls his brother rock or says rock to his brother shall be liable to the Sanhedrin. Uh, it's a very appealing theory. I'm sorry to say that I don't think the linguistic evidence supports it, but I have to emphasize that it is an considerable uncertainty. You're exactly right. The reason the word is left transliterated in the Greek of the New Testament is because it isn't perfectly clear what that was. That is to say, the person who was writing down the Greek couldn't think of a Greek equivalent. That is, in fact, one of the reasons that I think it's unlikely to mean what Arbeitman and others have suggested it does, because I can think of some Greek equivalents <laughs> for that. That doesn't mean that the gospel writers did. The trouble is, it is an Aramaic word. Um, that is being quoted there, not a Hebrew word. As you may or may not know, there are two letters in the Hebrew Aramaic alphabet which could be transliterated with the Greek letter kappa. And you can't tell, looking at R-A-K-A, -A, um, which of the Aramaic um, equivalents of kappa is being transliterated by kappa. One of them would mean um, effeminate, or queer. Uh, the other would mean fool. The trouble is that there is a lot of Talmudic literature on this about the penalty for calling somebody raka, and it's all the meaning fool. There are no instances of penalties being liable to the Sanhedrin for calling somebody raka in the sense queer. Indeed, I don't know of any places in Aramaic literature where that occurs. Um, so that I would have to say, as an honest historian, it's more likely that it means fool, even though it's an appealing interpretation and it's possible. I just think the evidence is ways against it. I bet I didn't use the word lesbian once. Um, I think there's a tape, you can check it. <laughs> what can I say? There are probably three reasons for this. And then I'll tell you what I can to make up for it. The three reasons are not a justification, they are only an explanation. The first is that in fact, lots of other groups belong in this survey and I had to limit myself and the position of gay women is often significantly different from gay men, so they can't just always be subsumed under the same rubric. The second reason is that I was socialized in an incredibly sexist society and probably don't regularly think about lesbians as much as I should. 
And the third reason is that the historical record about lesbians is so slight that it is very hard to construct articulate arguments about the attitudes of ancient societies towards lesbians. There are ways in which the position of lesbians is parallel to the positions of gay men and to the positions of Jews and other things. There are ways in which it's quite distinct. In general, I would say that lesbians have suffered less physical oppression because men have felt that female sexuality was unimportant except as it occasioned them difficulty. That is to say, female sexuality has important, been important to most men because it caused most men to feel lustful and this was a problem for them in an anti-sexual tradition. Female sexuality as an issue to women occurs in the historical record with a silence I can only characterize as deafening. Um, and lesbian sexuality is subsumed under the general lack of interest on the part of male writers, and so there isn't very much to say. However, the lack of physical violence and law against lesbian sexuality may be matched by a kind of oppression which is in many ways worse, I think. Being treated as a non-person may be in many ways the most crushing kind of oppression there is. It's extremely difficult to grow up in a vacuum imagining either that you're the only one ever to exist or not even ever recognizing exactly what you are because this category is never presented to you. And so you just have a vague unhappiness. You don't fit in, you don't know why, you don't know what you might be, you have no opportunity to realize what you might be. In that sense, lesbians may have been the most oppressed minority of all, but it's very hard to tell. There is some lesbian literature, and I have published um, in my book what lesbian literature I was aware of at the time. I'm now aware of some more lesbian literature, but not a whole lot. Some of you may know um, the book, The Lesbian Nun in uh, Renaissance Italy. Uh, we do have some new information about lesbians, but the historical record was to a large extent created by men and for men. And it's probably going to take a very long time before even what there is in it is dug out. And I'm afraid it will never be as much as what there is about men. So I'm sorry about that. I keep trying to do better, but I'm very grateful when people remind me that I'm not doing well enough on this. I really wish that more women, lesbian women or um, heterosexual women, would try to write about this because I'm not sure that I have sensitivities enough to get everything there is out of the historical record anyway. It's not that I think women have to do women's history or Jews have to do Jewish history. I think anybody can do any kind of history. But women doing women's history will probably see different things from men doing women's history. Uh, just as Christians doing Jewish history will probably have a perspective that Jews won't do. And so it's very important since men have been the main people doing history for 2,000 years that women start doing more history, and I hope they will then there will be fewer silences from uh, in talks like this. Um, yes? It's such an interesting thing. Very few religions, not none, but very few religions idealize celibacy in the way that Christianity does. And it's a really delicious irony that a church which blames many people for unnatural sexuality should require celibacy of its teaching body. Um, a lot of people interpret the Catholic emphasis on celibacy as simply an anti-corporeally, an anti-corporeal rejection of sex and argue that Christians just have a bad attitude towards pleasure in general and sex in particular. I frankly think that greatly oversimplifies there are many Christians who have bad attitudes towards pleasure in general and sex in particular, but there are many people everywhere who have guilt feelings um, because they're Jewish, because they're Russian, because they're Muslim, whatever. They have guilt feelings about sex and have generally negative attitudes. I think that is an element in the Christian tradition, but I think there are two other factors that help to explain it. One is that sex is trouble for everybody. Um, I mean, living in a liberated age does not make the problems go away. I bet half the people in this room are unhappy about some aspect of their sexual life. If you turn on the radio, what you will mostly hear are songs about the torment of being in love or how awful it is that my baby dumped me or something like that. <laughs> a 
lot of human literature, an astoundingly high percentage of human literature, from Greek plays to modern novels, is about the miseries of being a sexual human being. And I don't think it's very surprising that many ethical systems adopt a somewhat severe way to deal with that. In the case of Christianity, there is the Alexandrian rule, which is the only reason, legitimate reason to have sex is for procreation. And I think this rule has more humanity in it than you might immediately apprehend. I don't think personally that it should ever have been the hallmark of Christian moral teaching, but it recognizes the truth that in the 20th century we could too easily forget. Prior to the 1920s and 30s, people had no effective means of birth control. Every fun frolic on a warm spring day could result nine months later in the birth of a child and in a subsistence economy in societies which were much poorer than most of us have ever known, this could be a real tragedy. I think a lot of the point of what seemed very rigid, unloving, severe Christian morality is to help people remember that you pay for this. It isn't like paying for an ugly sin. It's the way the world is constructed. You are likely to pay for this. It may seem now like it's just fun and it's not hurting anybody, but you will pay for it. What are you going to do, abandon the child, have him grow up and starve? So that's part of it, and I think celibacy was to a certain extent an effort to remove the clergy from this dilemma altogether, because I can tell you that most Catholic parents had a lot of trouble with it and didn't cope very well. The other aspect that I would mention, which is the most positive of all, I think, is that the idea behind celibacy to a large extent is not denying sexuality, but dedicating it. To, to many people, I don't suggest this is true of all celibates, but to many people, and I think to a large extent the official rhetoric of the church is, this is the greatest thing you could give to the church or to a higher being. It's a very beautiful and powerful and urgent and meaningful part of life, and you devote it to God in the same way that people in the ancient world had given their first crops, or a ram, or gold, or something valuable. The idea for Christian, the Christian clergy was, you give this part of yourself, which is about the biggest sacrifice we could ask you to make. So I think it came from all those things, not any one. Some are positive and some are somewhat negative, and I think the idea of celibacy, which is quite a striking thing about the Christian tradition, arises from all of those things. It will be obvious to most people in here that Christianity replaces the Jewish obsession of purity in relation to food with um, the Christian uh, obsession with sex. Um, in a play that some of you may have seen, a Jewish character says, I wonder if being Jewish means you're always hungry. Um, because, uh, there is this thing in Jewish culture about food, and one could say, I wonder if being a Christian means you're always horny. Because, uh, there is this thing in Christian society about how you must use it properly and you mustn't abuse it and these are the circumstances which you can and those are the circumstances which you can't. It's very like keeping kosher um, in a way. Does that answer your question? There's no easy answer, but... Um, I think you had your hand up before. Um, have you published your material on, on gay marriages? Where can someone find out? No, um, I don't think you can find out about it yet. Um, I'm working very hard on getting it together. I, mean, I have next fall off from teaching, and so I hope it will all be finished uh, by about next December, which means it probably couldn't appear in print for about another year. A lot of people, since I've indiscreetly started talking about this before it was ready to publish, have asked me and impressed on me how important it would be to have and whatnot. But I'm sure you can easily see that it won't do very much good to publish it unless I publish it in a very responsible way. A lot of people will have an interest in denying that it's what it appears to be anyway, and so I think I have to publish it very carefully. I've spent the last four years gathering the materials on it, and I think I have everything I need now. So. Yeah, it will be a book. Because in order to understand what it means, you have to understand not only what it grew out of. For instance, I'm going to have to publish the life of Surgeon Bacchus for people to understand why they're cited in the marriage ceremony, which had not been translated before. But also, you really have to understand what marriage meant. I mean, immediately people are going to say, well, but what does marriage mean? Is this marriage like heterosexual marriage? Which suggests subtly that heterosexual marriage has been a single unified thing from early Christian times to now. Modern marriage is very different in expectations, assumptions, and reality from what marriage was, let's say, in the fourth or fifth century of the Christian era. And so I'm going to have to show that, that it is like what heterosexual marriage has been at some times in the Christian tradition. And I'm going to have to go over that. So it will be a book-length study trying to cover all those things. How 
I think lesbians and gay men are normal, and the real issue is how to make people perceive what a useful definition of normality is. I mean, in one sense, nobody's normal. Absolutely nobody is just like anybody else. Nobody matches any psychological profile. Um, everybody has some weird thing about them that they're terrified uh, will be found out. I expect most American teenagers think that they are part of the out group and that there's something about them which makes them less than fully acceptable. So you wonder who the in-group is and who is fully acceptable. I really think it's a small minority of people who feel, yes, you know, I'm one of the in-group, I'm normal. Um, most every sensitive person, at least, I think, thinks there's something abnormal about them. The trouble with gay, being a gay person is that queer is the touchstone of badness in our society. It is the most peculiar and disturbing thing. Um, some of my friends in the room know that I grew up outside the United States, living in other countries because my father was in the service. And it was immensely shocking to me, never having heard this before, to come back to the United States and discover that what determined whether you were good or bad among American adolescent males was whether you did things that were queer or not. You know, Queers wear this, queers walk that way. Queer stress this way. I remember in a high school that I went to for a year in, in the US, there were these tests of how you looked at your fingernails and your heels and things like that. You know, and <laughs> queers do it this way and other people do it that way. Um, it's funny in a way, but it's a very bizarre and disturbing thing. Why should we be socializing, especially boys in our society, to worry about being queer instead of worrying about being brutal or unkind or dishonest or cruel? None of those things is as bad to an adolescent boy as being queer. Almost any normal American adolescent boy would rather be brutal, dishonest, cruel than queer. It's the most bizarre thing. One of the things that America could do in terms of lesbians and gay men um, becoming normal would be to stop this thing from going on among young Americans. I mean, adolescents don't know what sexuality is about. They get funny ideas. They say a lot of cruel things. But I don't think parents should tolerate this. I don't think public officials should tolerate this. This should not be the test zone. Aside from what it does to gay lesbian people, it's such a distortion of values among adolescents anyway. That this, I mean, they usually don't have a clear notion of what it is to be queer anyway. The category could be applied to almost anybody. But at bottom, it is a category related to gay people. What gay people have to do, I think, is be comfortable with the idea that their standards are just as valid as anybody else's standards. If you are um, a bull dyke or a catcher or a Nelly queen or whatever you are, you are just as much a part of the human community as anybody. Your standards are just as valid. And I think you can try in a comfortable way to let your friends, first of all, be aware of your standards. It's a case where I think that gay people can do a lot just by ceasing to be so afraid. I think that an awful lot of gay people make their own prisons. There are real dangers in being known as a gay person in American society, but the dangers are exaggerated by everyone living in fear, not helped. If everyone would push themselves, if every gay woman or man would push herself or himself to the limit of what they can reasonably do in terms of having the people around them hear their standards and know things, it would help. <coughs> One of the things that you can do that I advise a lot of for instance, gay students at Yale who come to me, which may seem obvious, but if it hasn't thought, of, if you haven't thought about it before, let me impress upon you before, impress it upon you now. Often, a very useful thing you can do doesn't involve your saying to the people around you, you know, I'm gay, except me. One of the things you can do is when you discuss issues like social issues or social justice, have the guts to mention gay people along with blacks or Jews or women or whatever your social agenda is. A lot of gay people are terrified that if they ever say the word gay, everybody will be like, you know, <laughs> like my broker is E.F. Hutton, you know. <laughs> and as long as everybody's afraid to say the word gay, it does draw attention to you. If both gay people and straight people would start saying, you know, it, discrimination against gay people is bad. If people would use gay people as models and acknowledge that gay people are interesting, not because it's titillating or prurient, but because they are part of the human community. If in discussing sexuality, you would include homosexuality as one of the normal things you would be talking about, um, that would just change attitudes a lot. And then everybody would start to think of this as a more normal thing. 
I'm afraid that the heterosexual majority can do more than gay people can to change notions of what's normal. But gay people can do this kind of thing. Dr. Boswell, are you not thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> I am indeed thirsty. Thank <laughs> you.